God had given me this talent mm -hmm. and say, here, this is your gift from me. Work at it mm -hmm. and continue to better yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I did. You did. I took extra batting practice every day of my 19 years in baseball. Extra every day. Every day. And also, the day that I retired, I took extra batting practice. The day you retired, you took extra batting. You did one more. One more. Because I was given this gift and I didn't want to just say, okay, you know, it's all over and done with, but I still had that energy inside of me that I wanted to do more. Welcome back to the program, everybody. Today is a special day for me. Like, uh, it's a surreal day because not only is the man to my left a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer, he's got 3,000 hits, he had 388 one year, he's one of the all-time greats in Major League Baseball, but he's been one of the all-time most influential people in my life as a young man. He became a mentor to me. I haven't seen him in decades, and now he's in my living room on my show which is just gonna be an incredible experience. We're gonna talk about his amazing life. This will be one of those shows where if you're driving, you're gonna pull over because you're gonna lose your breath a few times about this man's life story, what he's learned, his lessons, and uh, the incredible experience and journey that his life has been. So everybody, this is Hall of Famer Rod Carew. Rod, thank you for being here, brother. Thanks for having me. It's so good to have you. It's surreal for me to have you here because Probably somewhere in the show, they're weaving in videos of me and you hitting together when we were little kids. You helped all these, these young men in your life. But he's got a book out called One Tough Out. And uh, <laughs> it is the perfect title because those of you that may not know this, not only is he a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer, but this man's lived through a massive heart attack that would have killed him if he was on the wrong golf hole. He's had a heart yeah. transplant. There's another heart in this man's body beating right next to me. He's also had the tragedy of losing his daughter, Michelle, to leukemia. And so there's an awful lot of life lessons that could have taken this guy out that didn't. So we got a lot to talk about today. I've been fortunate, you know, it's, it's been great. When I tell people, I am so blessed. You feel you know? blessed? Oh yes, I am so blessed because my mom always told me, God's gonna follow you for the rest of your life. Hmm. And I believe it because of some of the things that I went through as a youngster growing up, trying to get to the big leagues, mm -hmm. he was right there with me. But what surprised me, I was reading about you, Rod, was you did have this amazing mother, but there's a lot of people listening to my show, listen, they've got a dream right now, right? They wanna be yeah. a successful entrepreneur, or they want their, to be well known on social media, or they wanna find their dream spouse. They got a dream. And they feel like a million miles from it. Yeah. And you, end up becoming this Hall of Fame Major League player. And for people that aren't my age, I'm, you guys, I'm talking about one of the unbelievable hitters of all time in baseball. In fact, I was at your 3,000th hit game against the Twins, by the way. I was in center field when you got your 3,000th hit. The pitch, swing and a line drive, base hit, there it is, number 3,000 for Rod Carew. Downing stops at third. But you couldn't be further away. Rod is the only, up until Mariano Rivera, Hall of Famer ever from Panama. Right. And your dad wasn't a very supportive dude of yours oh, at right. all. So what was it like having a dad that wasn't really, uh, to put it mildly, supportive? You talk about it in the book. And then to find yourself someday living this dream, playing in front of these stadiums in Major League Baseball. I had an uncle that took interest in me. Hmm. And as I went to school, gym classes, you know, he, he, he was in charge of the physical education part of, mm -hmm. of the school. And my dad used to beat me. I mean, and he beat me mm -hmm. with, with everything that he could find. Oh. And there were days that, you know, we had this little window looking out and he always took this path. Mm -hmm. And at three o'clock I would sit up in that little window and just see how you, he was walking. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was in trouble that day. Really? I'm, I might not have done anything, but what happened at work, it brought it home to me. Mm. And I used to stand at the doorway. I had a hose, I had an iron cord, mm. I had a rope, so he could have his choice. My God. So, what are you going to use today? You would hold in I, your hands the weapon your father would use on and you. And he's just, yeah, let's go in the other room. Mm. And, you know, I never 
had welts or anything on my body, but I remember when, when I had my daughters and I used to go to the lake, they never saw me without my shirt hmm. because I still felt like the beatings I took back there psychologically, I felt like I had a lot of scars back there. Wow. You know, so they, Daddy, why don't you take your shirt off? You know, jump. I'd always jump in with my shirt on. You're kidding me. Yeah. And, and so that went on for uh, years, even when I played baseball. I never turned my back towards the players in the shower. I always found a corner that I could stand in by myself with my back facing the wall. Because Rod, you're serious. You're in the major leagues. You would still not do that. Yes, right. Wow. It's crazy. People says, well, you don't have any scars. And I says, yeah, but I, I go back to all those beatings I took on my back. Kind of screwed me up a little bit, but. I wonder if it didn't, though. One of your great legacies is how great, and by the way, now we're going to get into something that most of my audience will probably can't even believe when they hear this story. But one of the great things about your legacy, and I'm one of these children, is how kind you were to children as a player and after your career. And I wonder if that, maybe even a career you That was you a promise. Now. What do you mean? I made to myself. You did? That every child that I meet, I'm going to make him feel good about himself. I don't care from what type of background. I'm going to make him feel like, you know, he's a big shot. You know, because I knew I was coming from some tough things in my life that I know how you can hurt kids and ruin kids' lives. And, you know, I was fortunate that if God wasn't in my pocket, <laughs> I don't know where, where I would have been. I'm one of those kids. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm one of those kids. We would uh, certainly not be sitting here right now in my home together had you not been so kind to me and built me up at a time where I have a great dad, but he was an alcoholic at those, in those years. And so was mine. Was he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you provided for me at the, that age, uh, exactly what you just described. You made me feel like a big deal. You made me feel important. You made me feel very special. And so thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. You know, and I, I did it because of what I have had in here before I went through the transplant. <laughs> transplant, you know, just a good heart. Baseball player, one of the greatest hitters of all time. And I'm in the cage, I'm hitting, I'm hitting like this, and behind me I hear a man say, who's the little lefty? Who's the little lefty? And they go, oh, that's little Eddie. And I hear him talking, and I hit another one, <laughs> line drive up the middle, <laughs> line drive up the middle. And all I'm thinking about is what had happened to me that day. I'm still wearing the same jock strap, by the way, okay? <laughs> Line drive up the middle, just one of those dream moments, right? And the guy goes, I like this kid's swing. And I look and they turn in the batting cage and guess who's standing there? Rod Carew, number 29. And he goes, hey kid, where'd you learn to hit like that? I said, oh my God. I said, I learned by watching you. He goes, let's hit a few more. And he stood at the great Rod Carew. Standing right there, he goes, let's hit a few more. He goes, I like your swing. He goes, flatten the bat out a little bit. Spread your right foot out, open your toe. I'm going, that's Rod Crew. And he goes, you're good. You're really good. I think you could be a great player someday. And he didn't stop at that. He said, in fact, would you like me to work with you? I went, yes. He goes, well, here's what I do. When I'm in town on Tuesday nights, they come over to my cages and I work with about five, six guys just like you. I'd love to work with you. Can you be there next Tuesday? Uh, yes, sir. I can be there. And for the next five years of my life, my baseball mentor, my life mentor, became Rod Carew. And I'd sit in the batting cage with Rod. I'd sit in the cage with Rod, and he'd tell me exactly what to do. But on that, he goes, you're out working everybody, buddy. You're going to do something great someday. With your work ethic, you're going to do something great. You're going to be a great college player. Every Tuesday he was in town, every Tuesday for years. And this man took this shy boy who had just had that experience in baseball over the next five years, constantly loved on me, constantly told me how great I was, constantly told me he believed it. And because of what a powerful example he was, when you have one of the five greatest hitters in the history of baseball tell you you're great, you believe it. You did have a good heart and you do have a good heart. And that's probably where we need to go. We need to talk about this heart thing because guys, if you've ever believed in 
I don't know, if you believe in karma, if you believe in you reap what you sow, I'm a product of your kindness. And maybe if you didn't have that dad who you'd hand the weapons to to beat you, maybe you wouldn't have been so aware to be kind to all of these children. But this part right here, guys, this is gonna take your breath away. So let's, let's go to the heart. Let's talk about the heart for a minute. And so you are, and you, by the way, it's hard for everyone to get, you're Rod Carew, right? <laughs> so you're playing golf one day, and I'm gonna let you take them through the story, but you know, you're playing golf like probably any other day that you've played golf before, and let's, let's tell everybody and what happened. The night before, we had a program, program at the stadium, the Leukemia Lymphoma Walk. Okay. And I joined with Dennis School, the, one of the presidents of the Angels, and we put on this big event at the, at the ballpark okay. where you could rent a, a spot and you could make t-shirts for whatever group you're walking for. So we had a good night and then I decided to go home and think about playing golf by myself because I was too embarrassed that you know, I wasn't good enough to be playing with people. I'd, Is that right? Yeah, because one time a guy looked at me and he says, you were an athlete? <laughs> I've had yeah. that same thing said to me. <laughs> yeah. I says, yeah, I said, you know, but, oh my God. you know, we all don't do the, play the same games the right way. <laughs> I said, I play mi military golf, you know, left, right, <laughs> you know, and I still have fun, you know? Right. But I got up the next morning about uh -oh. five o'clock. Okay. And I thought, well, I know, I know this slow course in Corona that I can go and I can play by myself really? and nobody can watch me. Wow. So I was the first person at the golf course that morning at 5.30. Okay. And I went out to the first tee and I hit a ball straight down the middle and I says, you gotta be kidding me because <laughs> usually I'm slicing or cutting or whatever, but it went straight down the middle. So I said, oh, that's good. I'll just go out and mm -hmm. hit my ball out of the fairway. But before I did that, <clears throat> I was putting my club back in, into my golf bag. And all of a sudden my hands got clammy. You know, I never, mm. never felt anything like it. And then I had an indigestion burn yep. in my chest when I said, boy, that's strange. But before that, I'd, I went out with this friend of mine and he was in Vegas for the weekend and he was playing craps and he was winning and all of a sudden he felt something different Ooh. in his chest. Mm. And so he picked his money up, went up to the doctor at the hotel and he says, you have a problem. Mm. So best thing to do is when you get home, go see your cardiologist and get it taken care of. Mm -hmm. And he had about a 90% blockage. Oh my gosh. And <clears throat> that came back to me right away. No way. You feel something funny, mm -hmm. go see your doctor right away. Okay. So I backed the car, I was on the first hole, yeah. backed the car up to the clubhouse, got off, I went into the, there was this, 14 year old kid and this lady getting everything ready for the day's people that were coming in. So I walked in and I says, ma'am, would you please call the paramedics? And she says, okay. She gets on the phone and she was talking to her husband and the kid looked at her and says, did you call the paramedics for him? Oh my gosh. And she says, I'm talking to my husband, but he needs a paramedic. Oh my gosh. And then she, when she got off the phone, she told the little boy and I that her husband was a paramedic and he was oh. asking her questions about me. Mm -hmm. You know, what color are my, my hands and my lips and all this stuff. And so then she called the paramedics and, and, and sure enough, she laid me down on the floor with my legs propped up. And it seemed like when she did that, the paramedics were already there, wow. you know? But I, I had flatlined. You flatlined? Yeah. And they came in and uh, they brought me back. My gosh. And so while they're working on me, all I could hear was this voice yelling, let's go, let's go, we're losing him, we're losing him. And I flatlined again. They brought me back and the guys were talking to me and telling me I'm gonna be okay, telling me I was gonna be okay. 
And at the same time, the only thing that came to my mind was, I've got to make sure that Rhonda is available and they mm -hmm. can pick my phone up and look for Ice Honey. <laughs> Don't look for Mrs. Carew, look for Ice Honey That's and call her. Yeah. <laughs> so going back, I remember when Michelle was in the hospital. Michelle's she, his daughter. Everybody. Michelle's my youngest, the one that, mm -hmm. that died. Mm -hmm. You know, and she would say, I'd be laying in bed with her and I'm, we're doing crosswords mm -hmm. from the Enquirer yeah. and the Star because she, she, she was in there all the time. And she loved doing those yeah. crosswords. So yeah. I would lay them and do, do it with her. And then she says, you know, Pop, you can't see it right now, but right over in the corner is my guardian angel. And he's got this light shining glittering around him. And he's sitting there like this and he's praying for me, but you can't see him. Hmm. I said, okay. What hit me was, oh boy, she'd been on a lot of drugs. So maybe mm -hmm. she's imagining these things. Yeah. But as these paramedics were working on me, one of them had a light Gosh. around his whole body. Gosh. And I said to myself, I'm going to be okay because that's my guardian angel. Wow. You know, wow. so. Um, All of a sudden you flash back to laying yeah, in bed I've, with her and the guardian angel. Oh yeah. my gosh. And so after we, wow. you know, they got me going again and they were getting ready to put me in the, in the ambulance to transport me to the hospital, I flatlined again. I, so I flatlined three times. And um, I wasn't worried. You weren't? No, because I says, Father, you can take me anytime. You know, I'm ready to go when you want to take me. Hmm. And as I'm laying in the hospital in, in Riverside, all these thoughts came rushing back, you know, that I've got a guardian angel. Oh, my God. I know that, as my mom had said, God's going to be in your, your pocket the rest of your life. He was there. So I wasn't afraid. You right. know, I, I didn't. Did you have a sense it also just wasn't your time to go yet? Yes. Yeah. And he's keeping me here to do more things for him. Wow. You know, that's, that was my first thought because after I came out of it, I yelled out to my wife. I says, honey, he's not ready for me yet. He says he's leaving me here to do more of his work. Oh, my gosh. And I said, well, what are you talking about? I says, you know, God, God doesn't want to take me yet. He's going to leave me for a, a, a little bit more time to do some more of his work. She says, okay, and then... You, but you knew. I knew it. You know, it, it's yeah. amazing to me because we're going to talk about Michelle a little bit later, but the idea that as you're going through this, your life's ending. Yeah. Your life technically ended three times. Yeah. That you flash back to you laying in bed with your beautiful young daughter who's dying as well, and her sort of ironically during this moment comforting you, reminding you of that guardian angel back then is just life's full circle. I also have this bizarre feeling that part of that work is just me and you talking today and this going to millions of people. That was one yeah. of the other reasons God kept you here. Right. And, but I just have to say everybody this, as, as unbelievable as that is, by the way, if you were on the third or fourth hole, you probably are gone, correct? Yes, because there's no one out there. So you'd be gone. So it was on the first hole, Clubhouse is right there. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Because I, that's what I tell people. I says, you know, if I was on the second hole, the third hole, mm. they would have found me dead out there on the, probably sprawled out on the tee box. <laughs> you know? Hopefully you will have hit one of the straight shots before Hopefully, it. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> It wasn't one of those yeah. out of bounds slices the wrong way. By the way, just curious, you play left or right-handed? Left-handed. You play left like I do. He's a lefty. Yeah, the, the only thing I do... Uh, left-handed is hit and play golf. Is that right? Everything else is right-handed. Yeah, well, you were good at hitting, by the way. Now, as crazy as that story is, this idea of the law of reciprocity, you reap what you sow, planting seeds that are harvested, karma, etc., is about to blow everybody's mind. You know, all day long, people in my show, these are good people, just every day making deposits in God's kingdom, doing something good, holding the door open, complimenting somebody texting someone saying, I love you, I'm thinking about you. These little things we do every day that, you know, and for us, it's just the goodness that we do. We don't think about what the ramifications of those good deeds could be. And I'm one of those children that you helped, but there was another one. And so now you've had this heart event. You need a new heart. Yeah. You need a new heart. You're That's going the to, only way I can go on. It's the only way that you can live. And the 
place in which you receive this heart from is one of the all-time in life greatest stories ever because again it's connected to just one of these children that you were just kind to yeah. so tell us everybody the story of how you ended up with your heart and who it came from i went to watch my son play basketball at preschool so i got there a little early and i was walking around the campus and this little boy was out there running around and he comes up to me and he says, you're Rod Carew, aren't you? I says, yeah. I says, who are you? I can't talk right now. Mm -hmm. I says, why not? He says, because you're Rod Carew, so I can't talk. <laughs> I relate to that. <laughs> you know? And so his mom came to pick him up and that's all she said he talked about. Mm -hmm. I met Rod Carew today mm -hmm. at dinner. I met Rod Carew. You guys don't know Rod Carew. I know Rod Carew. I met Rod Carew today. And oh, he's just God. on and on. After that, I never saw that kid again. And so when I was looking for a heart, he had grown up and he started playing football. Mm -hmm. And he was waiting to sign with uh, the New England Patriots. So he was working out. Mm -hmm. He had a seizure and he wasn't lucky because he, he passed away from it. Mm -hmm. And so the day of the funeral, I was in the hospital and kids were talking about, you know, his heart and what they were going to do with his body and different things and talking to his mom. And she says that I want my son to get someone that's deserving of his heart. We didn't know what, what was going to happen. Right. You know, it's, it's one of those things that my wife sat and my wife knew the lady. They started being in contact with each other. And she says, I want my son's heart going to yeah. your husband. Here's a little boy that I met when he was about, I don't know, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And here I am, now I'm in my 40s or 50s, and he comes back into my life. Incredible. To give me his heart. Incredible. I said, Father, thank you. Unbelievable. I will continue doing your work, Father. And thank you for giving me a second chance at life. Unbelievable. It's, it's absolutely impossible to believe if it weren't true and I'm sitting next to you and his heart is beating in your chest right yes. now as you're talking to me. And his name is, again? Conrad Ruling. Unbelievable. And it's amazing because now we became two families knit together. Wherever I go, Conrad's right there with me. He's right there with you. you know, it's, I, it's, it's truly one of the, your life story, that story, uh, that fact that I'm sitting here with you, that Conrad's sitting here with us, the fact that I've seen his mother literally put her head up on your chest and listen to her son's heart yeah. beating in your body, true? So true, because when I got out of the hospital, that's the first place we went, hmm. was to visit his mom and she asked me if it's okay for her to listen to Conrad. I says, you can listen to Conrad's heart anytime you want to. <laughs> just call me and I'll be here. Unbelievable. What did you learn from this, Rod? Do you sit back and just go, wow, just God's just amazing? Or what, what is your takeaway from, you had a near-death experience, you had a heart attack, you've had a heart transplant from a child who you were kind to as a young man. You've left Panama where basically you had this huge dream to play in the major leagues. You couldn't even watch it on television. You had to listen to it on the radio. Then you're in these stadiums. What do you, what have you, what is, there's, you, you've had this experience. It's just, it's, you have to read one tough out and I'm not promoting a book. It's just, yeah. this is not fiction. If this was a movie, people would go, this is like a Disney movie. Forget <laughs> it. There's no way this is true. It's corny, except it's actually true. And I'm actually sitting here with you right now. And you know, it's, um, when I was a, a kid growing up, every time that I took the field to play baseball, it was like I was better than everybody else. God had given me this talent mm -hmm. and say, here, this is your gift for me. Work at it mm -hmm. and continue to better yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I did. You did. I took extra batting practice every day of my 19 years in baseball. Extra, every day. Every day. And also, the day that I retired, I took extra batting practice. The day you retired, you took extra batting You did one more. One more. 
because I was given this gift and I didn't want to just say, okay, you know, it's all over and done with, but I still had that energy inside of me that I wanted to do more. That's incredible. You know, and I'm writing a book right now called The Power of One More. And so the fact that you say this, it's something I learned from you, yeah. is that you don't remember this, but we'd be hitting, and even if I hit a good last one, you'd always go, let's do one more, and we'd hit one more. And I have taken that since I was a little boy into in business, I'm gonna make one more phone call. If I'm running on the treadmill at the gym, it's 30 minutes, I go, let's do one more minute. Right. And the yeah. fact that you're now telling me that you retired and you took one more round of extra batting practice. Yes. Yeah. I was never satisfied. Mm -hmm. I, I knew the gift that I had. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I probably could have just gone through life and, and been a mediocre hitter. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be the best. You wanted to be great. Yes, I wanted to be in the class of Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Babe Ruth and Jackie Robinson and all these guys. But you, and you are. You know, it's interesting to me that people that are listening or watching this right now, they've been given a gift of some type as well. They may not be aware of what it is yet. When it's an athletic gift and it's baseball and there's millions of people, it's kind of obvious, hey, I've got this gift, I'm gonna become the yes. best. But there's little gifts, there's an opportunity, there's a new position at your job, there's a chance to improve your financial, there's someone you could meet. And it's that treating it as precious and doing the extra. Because I'll bet you played with, we won't name who they are, but you played with other guys who had a gift similar to yours. Oh yeah. And they didn't take the extra batting practice. They, did they didn't work in the off season. And I used to tell this one player in, in particular, you are going to be out of this game by age 32. I says, God has given you everything. Mm. You, you can throw the ball mm. as well as anybody. You can hit, you can run, you can field, but you're not using it. Mm. He says, well, you know, it, it's okay. I says, no, it's not okay. Mm. You've got the talent. Strive to be greater than some of these other guys that don't care. Yeah. You know, but he was out of the game at age 32. He really was. He really was. In a way, and you have this like, unbelievable career. How many, how many, you have seven batting titles. Right. right. So guys, in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, the batting title in the American League is now the Rod Carew Award. They've literally named the batting title every year after this man sitting here. Am I right about right. that? Right. That kind of means you were pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my buddy, Tony Gwynn, yeah. who they named it yeah. after in the National League. Who's a lot like you. Left-hander, yes. didn't hit for a lot of power, had to grind, had to work hard, incredible student of hitting. And, and we worked the same, we worked the same way every single day. We were working on something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because so many young players can look at videos mm -hmm. and they want to pick everything, pick themselves apart. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of looking for one thing that, okay, I'm, I'm going to look for this so that I can go out and spend some time working on it mm. and getting comfortable with it mm. and um, making the adjustment to, to make myself better. Would you always be learning even late in your career? You've already oh. hit 388 one year. You've led the league in hitting all these times. Were you still trying to find those little inches to improve yes. upon all the time? Every time I, I went out, it was to improve myself. Mm. I'll tell you a story about um, Nolan Ryan and I okay. had this thing between us. Okay. I'm number fourth on his strikeout list. I've got, he struck me out 29 times. Okay. <laughs> but I ended up hitting 300 off of him mm. because when I first came up to the league, I used to hold my hands up high. You did? Yeah. You didn't have the flat bat? The no, I, okay. my hands were up high. Okay. And so that's why Nolan struck me out so many times because I tried to hit that high fastball <laughs> and there was no catching up, right? <laughs> He's bringing the heat. Oh, <laughs> and so I decided that I've got to make an adjustment. So wow. for about three weeks, I took batting practice, extra batting practice, sitting on a stool that swiveled. Okay. And that kept me down. That's why I developed that Come on. unorthodox stance. Wait, you're telling me your whole hitting style that you're known for was born out of an adjustment to be yes. able to hit against someone like Nolan Ryan, or yes. actually Nolan Ryan? Yes. 
And so, wow. you know, I would take extra BP and then I stay down. I couldn't come up. Mm -hmm. And um, I did it for about three weeks. And then the first time I faced Noli, I got two hits. <laughs> and then the next time I faced him, I got three hits. Mm -hmm. And I remember this one game, he threw me a changeup and I bunted it down the third, third base line yeah. for, for a base hit. And he came over towards first base he and he's rubbing the ball. Pissed. He says, you're supposed to hit, swing at that pitch, not bunt it. <laughs> I says, I got a hit, didn't I? So people that don't know, Nolan Ryan's one of the all-time great intimidators, no-hit machine, <laughs> threw hard. Isn't it unbelievable, by the way, how many guys throw hard nowadays? Oh, yeah. The amount of velocity now, guys coming out of the pen throwing 99, 100 miles an hour. It's unbelievable how many guys but throw hard. But the difference is they don't do it consistently. Hmm. They don't throw strikes consistently. Hmm. They're not pitching today. They're just throwing. Throwing, yeah. You know, yeah. and... Um, very interesting. Anyway, to go on with the, with the yeah. Nolan story, we were playing this game in Minnesota and he was pitching. First time up, I get a base hit. Second time, I go up to the plate and he's yelling at me from the mound, stand up, stand up. <laughs> and I say, no, bring it down. <laughs> you know? And that's how I developed that unorthodox style that's of hitting. That's amazing to me. Because I had to make an adjustment. You know, and I made the adjustment and greater things started happening. For it's me. amazing to me how critical that point is in every area of our life is just making adjustments. Like for me, yeah. even in my speaking, when I was a young man, I'd speak on stage. There's a certain style of, you know, bravado and intensity. And over time, I thought I'd, and mainly the people I would reach were young, intense males. And then I started to think I'd like to reach a broader audience of people that with my message, I had to make an adjustment in the way I communicate. Now my audience is actually more women than it is men. And I attribute that to the adjustments in business. It's constantly Mike Tyson has that great saying where he says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> you have to make adjustments in life and <laughs> business. If true. you're listening to this, maybe there's adjustments that you need to be making that you're not aware of, that you're not thinking about, that you're not thinking about in advance. Also, one of the thing I've always wanted to ask you that baseball is a different sport and people that aren't fans of every sport, maybe, you, maybe this nuance isn't, you know, obvious to you, but like football, they're going to play 16, 18 games. Now there's a game on a Sunday. We all work towards that Sunday. There's an event. We have it. Then there's a the playoffs. Most sports are that way. Baseball is a grind. You're playing 162 games in a very short window of time. And there's a grind. There's a you have to maintain an emotional level of control yes. throughout a season, and most people, a lot of big league players, even struggle with that. Oh, yeah. How did you maintain emotional control through slumps, through ups and downs, through a full season, and then through a career as long as yours as well? Well, you know, to me, it, it wasn't a job. To me, it was just a little a little boy's game, like Campanella said. Mm. Little boys, baseball is a game little boys play. I never can tell you that I, I've gone through a slump where it has kind of knocked me off my, my heels and pushed me back. Because hmm. I remember I was, 0 for, the longest streak I think I had as a hitter, I was 0 for 17. That was your longest slump? Yeah, the longest. Four games? <laughs> so, I hate you. <laughs> so the 18th time, okay. I dropped a bunt down for a base hit. Made an adjustment. I hit a high chopper, didn't leave the infield for a base hit. Mm. I dropped another bunt down for a base hit. Mm. And then I had another high chopper for a base hit. Not one of those balls left the infield. Mm. Mm. But while I was going through this 0 for 17, I was hitting line drives and they were going right at somebody. Yeah. yeah. And great lesson. So guy says, how do you do that? I says, well, you know, I, I worked on my bunting, so mm. if I'm not getting hit, swinging the bat, I'm going to the next dimension. I love that. I think there's a lesson there, Rod, and I always go back to like, okay, how's this apply to other things? Yeah. And that it's true in business. We're always trying to hit these big home runs, and if you feel like things are slipping, just get some base hits 
get a sale, get an account, get some momentum, get in early, make extra phone calls, do the extra email, just lay the bunt down, yep. get some momentum going. Because sometimes the slump you're in business, you're hitting line drives. It's just not the time. Right. It's just timing. It's just things aren't, it's not always you're doing something wrong. Maybe it's just bad timing right now. Keep making adjustments, et cetera. And you know, the, the difference about me and other players is I had the six tool. Which was? You know, you know, they always say you have the five tools. Mm -hmm. The sixth tool was this. Your mind. I never let my mind get me in trouble. I stayed positive all, all the way. Hmm. I knew, yeah, I'm gonna make outs. Hmm. You know, this is a game that um, three out of 10 and you're successful. Yeah. You know, so I'm not gonna worry about days that I don't get a hit. Hmm. You know, like some guys, all of a sudden it's panic. You're right. You know, they, they panic. What am I doing wrong? You see, you, do you see something? No, you're just hitting the ball good, but you, you're hitting it right at somebody, mm -hmm. so. You think the mental part of your game was the separator oh, for Oh, yes, you? definitely. Mm -hmm. And I tell kids that today. Mm -hmm. I says, this is the most important tool. Mm -hmm. You can do everything else, but if you can't control what's going on up here, Things are going to be tough. One million percent. By the way, those of you listening to audio, he's pointing at his head. And he's talking about how important the mental part of the game is, maintaining emotional control, not stacking worries and thoughts that get bigger than they need to be. It's amazing to me. I work with a lot of athletes on their mental game, and people will ask me, you know, what are you really working with them when you're, if it's a UFC fighter or a boxer or a golfer? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell them often, the main thing we work on is their confidence. People say to me, there's no way confidence at that level of play. Yes, confidence at that level of play is even fragile for many athletes as well. That's so true. If you, is that not true? You're in dugouts That's with guys true. all the time. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. And I listen to them talk. It says, hey, dude. <laughs> pointing at it his head. Just to my head, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, 100% and... the mental side of the game. I want to ask you about the hardest part, I think, probably of your life. And I could be wrong, but speaking about mental toughness, which is... So guys, this man goes through this heart transplant. He ends up getting the heart from a child he was kind to. It's just bananas. If he's on the second hole, he's gone. He reverts back to the guardian angels of Michelle. And at the time when Michelle was struggling with leukemia, it became another national story. This was not some secret thing. This was something that I was following, that people all across the world, you were getting letters and mail and all these other things. I have to think that during that time, your mental emotional control was tested the most then. It's, this yes. is not a Major League Baseball game. This is your little girl yes. struggling and dying and, and I'm sure in a great deal of pain. And I don't want to be too personal about it, but there are people right now listening to this that are going through their form of tragedy, a business failure, a divorce, an illness in their family. I just lost my dad recently. What was that time like for you and what, what were the lessons and takeaways that you took from it? It was easy for me because she brought me into her fold. You know, she knew I didn't talk to the press much. Hmm. And she knew that it's going to be stretching the limit for me to be talking to a radio person or a writer or, hmm. or somebody about what she's, she's going through. But when I was checking her into uh, Children's Hospital in Orange County, all these kids were, they were like, 10 kids out in the hallway kicking soccer balls. They have their poles mm -hmm. and they're kicking soccer balls and some of them were wiffle bats and all this stuff. And she just walks up to me and she taps me on my shoulder and she says, Daddy, you've got to start talking to the press. Hmm. See all these kids? Hmm. Maybe we can save some of their lives. So she, she came to me and told me, and I says, okay, honey, I promise you that from today on until the day I die, I will give my full efforts towards helping kids. Hmm. And she says, you promise me? I says, I promise you. My gosh. You know, because I never spoke to the press I that know. much. You know, I, I kind of stayed away from them. And um, when she asked me to do that, I says, I will. I promise you I will. Hmm. You know, and um, for all the time she spent in the hospital, I remember that first day when she found out that she had leukemia, when the doctor told her. And she says, well, what do we do? 
doctor said, oh, we'll try and clean it up and make you better. She says, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. Didn't cry, nothing. Not for the time that she was in the hospital, she did not cry one single day. Not one single day, you know. And the, the week that she died, I went down to the ch chapel and I asked God to take her. He did. I says, Father, please take her. She's suffering, yeah. and I don't want her to suffer anymore. So, would you take her and put her in your in your garden? You know. And he gave us another week mm. with her, and then we found a four out of five cord blood that we were going to use to instead of the marrow. She could couldn't find any anyone with a marrow to save her life. And when she was walking in that room, she said, Dad, I know that I'm not coming out of there alive. She said, come on. She says, God's going to be with you. She says, Dad, I'm not coming out of there alive. And I know that God's going to be with me. So I'm not going to worry. Here's a 19-year-old kid talking to, to me like that, to her dad. And I'm like, you're going to be OK. You're going to be OK. But she knew. When she went in that room, she knew she was going to die. Wow. You know? Just like you knew you weren't yes. when you had your heart attack. Yeah. What an amazing story. I, uh, you just honored her so well with your life because you've done, guys, if you just do a simple Google search, you'll see all the tireless thousands of hours Raj put into doing things for children and how you've honored her, you know, little one-on-one -on -one things, things at the stadium like you were talking about. The thing you were doing the night before your heart attack yeah, was an extension of the promise that you made to yeah. her in the hospital. And you know, it's, it's funny. I, I remember driving down the five freeway. I had gone to Washington and spoke in front of Congress about mm -hmm. raising funds for the NIH, mm -hmm. you know, and then I got a call. My, my agent called me and he says, guess what? They just passed a $50 million bill for the kids. That's crazy. And I opened my sunroof and I says, honey, thanks so much. We did it again. You wow. know, and um, that's the way it was. And even today, some nights, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at home and I don't, don't have anything to do. I get in my car, I go for a drive and says, Pish, how are you doing? I used to call her Pish. Yeah. How you doing? I says, I'm hanging in there and I talk to her. You, really? you know, yeah, I, I do it many nights, you know, and um, it, it makes me feel good. Yeah. You know, and and I'm sure she's saying, I'm proud of you, Dad. I'm proud of you. I'm sure Keep she doing is. what you what you're doing. We're doing it right now. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You changed my life, you know, and I I. Uh, I'm just, I, I, I just thank you. And I, and today, um, not often in interviews, brother, where I kind of lose my ability to articulate words of how I really feel about somebody or something, but you've had this, I got a final question for you. I just, I'm so grateful that we've reconnected and I'm so grateful that I'm able to share this treasure of a human being with people I love. These people that listen to my show, I love them. And um, I would not be here without you. I would not be, I mean, I'm, I'll get emotional if I go any further than that. And there's, you would not be here had you not planted those seeds and had the heart that's in your chest. You've had this amazing life, Rod. I mean, you've had this, you're beaten as a young boy. You come from a place that no one ever made it in Major League Baseball the way you did before. You have this unbelievable career. The career ends, you then have this amazing legacy of what you do with children. Then you have this whole other chapter of your life where you lose a daughter, which is the worst thing a parent can ever have happen in their life is to lose a child. And then you have a way of honoring her that's just remarkable and a piece about it. Then you have this other chapter of your life where you have this heart attack and a heart transplant that's connected to a child that you reached out to. And now I feel like then you then one tough out. By the way, now that you've heard this man's story, would you agree this is he is a tough out? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was a tough out at the plate, but he's been even tougher out in life. And then now there's this other season now where being here with me today and sharing this story, 
is just another chapter in the, your life. And I'm just curious, I'm sure everybody would love to know the answer to this and just what your thoughts are. Obviously, faith has been the center of your life. What life advice do you have of any type? That There's been this ride that's just, it, it wouldn't make it past a, a producer's desk for a script because it's so unbelievable. And yet, and even our little version of our story that we're here today, what have you learned in life that we haven't covered today that you would, you know, you'd leave if you could have a message, your son's sitting here today with us. And yeah. I'm sure there's things that you, you know, lessons you've imparted onto him. If this whole audience was your sons, guys like me that have all been kind of extensions of your sons in your life, your actual son is here today with us physically. What would you advice you give all of us just about life and, and the pursuit of doing something great in our lives? Have faith in our friend upstairs. Mm -hmm. If you can maintain that faith, it's the greatest gift that you get from God. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I've had faith throughout everything that I do. You know, growing up, taking beatings from my dad, playing baseball, leaving the country and coming here and, and, and doing working with different organizations to make the dreams of kids come through. Mm. Because they all have dreams like I had a dream when I was a seven-year-old. And my dream was to be a, a baseball player, mm. to play in front of 50,000 people. And my mom used to say to me, you think you can really do that? And I says, you're going to be there when, I, when I'm playing in front of big crowds. And so when I played in, in front of like 50,000 people in New York and she was in New York, she just shook her head. She couldn't believe it, mm -hmm. you know? She says, you've made it, you've done it. Mm -hmm. And I said, mom, that's because of you, because of what you've taught me and showed me along the way and the faith that you had in me and the faith that you put in me to be God's son, that's what's it has done. Uh, brother, it can't really be this good today. I mean, just, it's been unfreaking believable And um, I just am really grateful for you in my life. I love you and I'm very, very, I'm proud of you. And I know Thank Michelle's you. proud of you. And I know most importantly, God's so proud of you, brother. You're shining. You're shining again. You're shining when you got over there and had your first at bat in the big leagues all the way through all those years. And here yeah. we are in your mid seventies and you're shining even brighter now. So I just want to say thank you. Oh, pleasure's mine. And mm. I hope that with this, that we can help other people. Yeah. We can have people sit down and think about their lives and what God means to them mm -hmm. and the faith that they have to have in themselves. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Yes. I don't hope it. I know we did it today. I know you did it today. God's all over this conversation. So thank you, Rod. Everybody, I have uh, no words. Uh, obviously, it's a very emotional show for me today. If it affected you, I hope that you have a heart to share it with somebody you care about or a lot of people that you care about. This is one of those shows that should be played over and over. You should share it with your children, with your family, with your business partners. And uh, I hope that you subscribe to the show. And uh, this is why I do it. Today is the reason that I do the show, these types of conversations that you'll get once in your lifetime. So God bless you all. Max out. Hey, guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.